So, uh, a very warm welcome to uh, Gary John, who uh, finally got here uh, after some major challenges with, uh, <laughs> with uh, air travel. Uh, and thank you, for, thank you for persisting and for uh, for for uh, being with us this evening. Um, so we're we're going to take um, um, uh, twenty twenty five minutes to to hear the, the 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 presentation and for a bit of question and answer uh, before we go into these uh, uh, these breakout groups that are on the on the flip chart. Uh, so, and uh, the uh, the title of the talk is uh, uh, in uh, to me uh, mostly uh, unpronounceable uh, um, terms, but a good quality of life, living, governing, and protecting the Stadtium way of life in the Fraser River Valley. Um, and Gary is joined by uh, Sarah Moritz uh, from McGill University, doctoral student at McGill University. Um, uh, for this talk, so uh, welcome and Good evening, Kashwat Labn Shnuknukwa, Qual Kulten in Squaticha, Chalath Mok and Statlium Scan. And what I what I said was uh, good evening, my brothers and sisters, my friends and relatives. Um, my name is Gary John, and, and traditionally uh, I'm known in our territory as Qualcolton, and Qualcolton uh, was given to me by a couple of my cousins. Their dad carried the name, <clears throat> and I guess he had, back in the day he was a town crier, and he did all the announcements when there was good news and when there was, usually when there was not so good news, so he, they gave him this name, and it translates to one who speaks with a loud voice or with, or I guess depending on the context, it can also translate to a loud noise. So um, I want to sing you a song. It comes from our territory, <clears throat> and in our in our territory, we we know this is a loon song, and it's part of a, it's part of our creation stories. That when the great flood that happened upon the land, when the waters receded, the animals were all waiting to see how what what they had to do. They had to do some tests to see when the water was. Uh, shallow enough that they could go out and repopulate the land and uh, the beaver tried to dive down to see the turtle tried all the animals tried <clears throat> and then loon was the one who came down was able to make it down and come back up and when he floated back up he was unconscious but um, he had dirt on his he had dirt on his bill and that's how they knew that okay it's it's going to be really soon now so when the, when the animals and the people came down off the mountain, this is a song they sang. It's a song of thanks and a song of, of appreciation. Right for the next little while. So thank you again for the hospitality, and I want to acknowledge the territory that we're on today, and acknowledge the spirit, and let them know that I come in peace and friendship. Can you hear me okay? Thanks. <laughs> I'm 
I'm trying to grow some more. <laughs> Hello, uh, bonjour, kalswa ap, nchnuknukwa. Thank you very much for inviting us both to speak here today. We're very delighted and honored uh, to learn and share with all our partners that are here. Um, and we're very grateful to the uh, Atikamek hosting us on this land and their territory, their beautiful territory. We, we were coming in and we had um, a super, super massive moon greet us on the right and an absolutely beautiful sunset on the left. And um, we thought you'd be running for a long, long time if you wanted to run from home here. Um, In people's minds and hearts, there's the saying that fish, the lake, you see the fish, the dry fish on, on the top right, the lake and the river is life. And when the fish are gone, the people will be gone too. We heard about the recent Mount Polly um, tailing stamp failure from Jean Paul, I don't know if he's here. Um, resulting in 8 million cubic meters of toxic tailings materials into Polly Lake, Hazelton Creek, and the Quenelle watershed, and with significant impact to the Fraser River watershed also. We had similar responses of fear along the river. Um, people saying, well, we don't know if we can go fish, we can't go to camp. Um, this is a really, really sad time. Um, we won't be able to live well. But we also had responses that were more determined and maybe um, onward that said, um, as long as there's salmon, we'll fish because fish is our life. And if the fish die, then I'll die. So um, we're, we have some footage of that time and these responses um, coming in an upcoming film called The Salmon People, which I had hoped to show um, to some degree at this meeting, but uh, we're not finished yet. So stay tuned for that uh, film with more detailed footage. Um, Here is an image of the Stachlium traditional territory, um, a map created by the Stachlium Lands and Resource Authority with malleable boundary lines, as you can see, um, transformer sites and footprint markers that tell of a history of how the land and the people became what they are today and how they came about. This is the Tlath traditional area uh, where Gary John is from. Um, a community of approximately 350 people on reserve. How many people are off same. reserve? The same amount, so 700 people. Um, and the Chlathmich are known as the people of the lake and sometimes also as the crane people or the um, blue heron people. There's different names that, that have been passed on, but people of the lake is maybe... called a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the most, uh, most commonly used. The declaration of the Lillooet tribe that you see here to some degree, that it's an excerpt, um, is a key, a very essential legal and political position document drafted by the Stadlium chiefs with the help of ethnographer James Tate to protest the theft of their lands around the year 1911. In their words, we claim that we are the rightful owners of our tribal territory and everything pertaining thereto. We have always lived in our territory. At no time have we ever deserted it or left it to others. We have felt keenly the stealing of our lands by the BC government, but we could never learn how to get redress. But now we commence to think that we may get a measure of justice. And I'm skipping a part here, but in conclusion, the chiefs say, we wish to protest against the recent seizing of certain of our lands at the short portage by white settlers on authority of the BC government. We also wish to protest against the building of railway depots and sidings on any of our reservations as we hear is projected. 
There are major environmental impacts and resource extractive issues and conflicts in the area. I'll briefly introduce three here and Gary John will elaborate more afterward. First surveyed in 1912, the Bridge River Power Project had reached a preliminary stage of completion in 1934 to produce power for the locality. The Bridge River hydroelectric complex now consists of three dams and stores water for four generating stations. Here you see the Carpenter Reservoir, um, that's part of it. The system uses Bridge River water three times in succession to generate 492 megawatts. And here you see a couple more powerhouses. The consequence of this development included flooding, forced relocation, loss of fisheries, hunting, trapping, gathering sites for many Stadlium families for the construction of several dams and generating facilities. And this is especially true for the Schlath community who have lost many of their traditional fishing spots. And the need to fish in the Fraser River, um, you'll see, um, I don't know if I can, there's a map coming up. To the right, uh, you're very far right, um, is, is uh, more urgent um, and has to be negotiated and coordinated much more in a, in a, in a manner of a fast food fishery where all of Upper Stadlium are coming together to, to share um, camps so that everybody gets fish because of a loss of so many sites. You already saw slide nine, um, a, a quick map from 2014 to show um, mining and mineral claims in the area. The um, Bridge River camp encompasses five former mines, including two large gold producers, Bray Learn and Pioneer and a few others. Um, and the impacts have mostly to do with road, water and access and forestry and mining in the area function in a duality. They create access for each other in a sort of hybrid fashion. There's also been uh, um, uh, massive forestry and logging activities and proposed logging. Gary John will talk about uh, a very significant um, protest and case uh, where logging of a very important area, CP146, was um, averted um, and that has a lot of significance today. And here we're compiling some key notions of the good life and uh, living well used in protecting against these impacts. And these include the Stadlium vision, which is of a continuing and renewed relationship between Stadlium people, the people of the land, and the land, and Klatkmen are the good ways, a good way of life. And Nchatmen, are the laws and that's how life is lived. Included in the good ways are many things that range from hereditary and traditional forms of governance, helping one another, speaking the language and passing the language on to young people, positive family relationships in um, uh, expansive webs of sharing, the passing on of names. We heard the beautiful name of uh, uh, my partner here. He's, he's noisy and loud and he's heard. Training for different roles um, or inherent gifts that include dreaming, sensing, knowing, feeling, and the ability to do things in a good way. And the chiefs who signed and drafted the Declaration of the Lilloet Tribe, for example, relied on people, the Tsihualus, who had the ability to see things very clearly. A key element in all of this is living off the land, to manage actively, to hunt fish, pick berries, to put food away for the winter, always. And that means to be independent and not dependent, not to be dependent on welfare. The land, the elders say in this context, is like a garden, and it has to be used that way. Knowing the land has to be part of everyday life and be protected. Another key concept you see at the bottom that is what to tila 
the way it is, the way things are. And so the elders say, our history is written on the land since time immemorial. We, the Stachlium, have always lived in mutual accord with one another in our environment and will continue to do so. We inhabit the territory and are self-sufficient. We utilize our lands and resources governed through traditional management. How am I doing for time? Okay, good. Um, these are just two very important uh, documents and I presume Gary John will say a bit more about them. The uh, land use plan um, that was drafted in 2004 that has very important protection areas for grizzly bears, for mule deers, cultural protection areas that are laid out in very complex ways. And the Stadlium tribal code that governs all affairs in the territory. And to uh, briefly mention a couple of examples of how we're trying to bring the good quality or the good life back um, into people's lives against these impacts and ongoing colonial legacies. Um, as part of my work, I'm involved with this crowd of people, um, a group of elders, leaders, a fisheries biologist, there's an archaeologist too, um, a student isn't on the picture, who uh, is um, a geographer and works on trails. <coughs> Um, on the Lower Bridge River Spiritual and Cultural Value Monitoring Project, which is part of a shared water use planning project um, uh, in which Stadlium and BC Hydro are trying to co-coordinate um, water use to the benefit uh, of water quality, riparian habitat, and uh, fisheries, especially the um, big spring salmon run that was almost depleted because of hydroelectric um, establishment. The Stadlium elders speak of the voice or the spirit of the Bridge River and have observed that in moving from a water budget of um, zero to three CMS, uh, there have been noticeable improvements in the water quality and the conditions for fish, wildlife, and the riparian vegetation. And a committee of three to eight, this, on this picture you see a few more, um, usually goes out on the land four times a year, I think actually more often, but four times a year is sort of the regulated number under a range of test flows according to cultural and spiritual quality um, uh, categories, sound, smell, movement, and interaction of people with the water, weight ability. Um, so you go, go down to the water and see what kind of relationship you can have to the water and then report back and then um, see what kind of recommendation has to be given to adjust the flow regime. The second example uh, in Schlath, uh, um, Gary and a few other people and I are working on a, a Wanish uh, Forever project to document past and present knowledge of the deep spawning kokanee salmon in the, the lakes, Anderson and Seton Lake. You saw the lakes on the map earlier. And these are rather distinct phenomena. They're landlocked salmon. Um, and they come every winter as a gift from the lake to the shore when the warm Chinook wind blows um, to feed people um, in a time of, historically, a time of scarcity. Um, but important in this is that whenever you harvest, you share with hundreds of bald eagles and other animals, uh, wolves, um, coyotes that come down to also feed. There's a whole web of, of sharing happening at the lake. And it is a metaphor for the creator and the land looking after the people. And uh, we're wondering about um, um, a massive depletion in this fish species uh, and trying to find ways to address this impact. BC Hydro is not uh, wanting to be held responsible for its impacts on the change of the water quality on the lake. There are many lim limnological changes. The algae aren't as um, um, balanced as they, as they used to be, and the water temperatures aren't um, appropriate for sustaining um, a large amount of uh, one ish. So um, we're, we're putting together information uh, to document and to educate children and youth. There isn't many children that go out and learn and eat the one ish. It's a very acquired taste. I think uh, 
you have to grow up with it um, to really appreciate it and, and never want to live without it. And um, to encourage harvesting or more harvesting um, along, along the lakes. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to my partner, Gary John, to elaborate on the um, strategies of protection and governance regarding these impacts and the good quality of life. Thank you. Well, where to start? Um, I'm sure that um, the indigenous brothers and sisters that are here are all um, very proud of your homeland. Um, you know, I, I feel that uh, I, I live on the other end of this lake in this picture here, <coughs> and as far as I'm concerned, I live in the most beautiful place in the world. I, I wake up to that every morning. Um, unfortunately, though, it, it, the, what I wake up to is a new reality. BC Hydro started their construction in the early 1900s. They didn't finish their final phase of construction until 1958, and the amount of impact is pretty significant on, on my community alone. We, it took us 20 years. We just signed an agreement with BC Hydro in 2011. It took us 20 years to complete that deal, and it covers the whole of the territory where BC Hydro's footprint is. Um, being the most uh, heavily impacted community, uh, the makeup of this particular lake that you see here, used to, it used to be crystal clear, like the clearest ocean in the world or the cleanest water in the world. Today it's a murky green color. Even though Lake Louise is a beautiful color, um, that's, a that's the color of our lake now because water is introduced from another valley. So we have water being introduced from other valleys, we have roads being built into areas, and then once a, once a mining road or a logging road goes in, whoever goes first, somebody else usually follows and wants to um, extract resources right behind them and take advantage of the opportunity because there's access now. <coughs> so in, in the, it, for instance, if hydro, if we use hydro as an example, hydro came in, uh, hydro took about, we, did, we don't, didn't have much reserve land in our beautiful valley. We had probably four square miles. After BC Hydro is done with their two powered stations, they have 14 high voltage power lines that run through our valley. And they, the 14 power lines that either originate in our valley or they transect and they get a boost up. Ironically, even though Hydro had been generating power in our valley since 1927, many of the homes in my villages didn't get power until 1972. So it is, it is a real, it was another kick in the teeth, but it's unfortunately, it's nothing new to indigenous people. So how do we turn some of that around and how do we make sure history doesn't repeat itself? We set up, um, more recently, um, we set up mechanisms, tried to work with government, and that's what the declaration that Sarah referenced, that we claim that we are the rightful owners of our territory. We also laid out some principles along with other tribes in the province that said, we're prepared to sit down with the Crown and, we're, and the state or We'll sit down with British Columbia as well, and that's why the BC Treaty process in, in British Columbia doesn't work for our tribe, because it's based on extinguishment, and we said we can't extinguish this any more than anybody in the room could. You just don't, we don't have that right as indigenous people or as Uchlamuch. We have responsibility as stewards to look after the land. <coughs> so to bring that about, in 19, excuse me, 1990, we sat on the tracks when the Mohawks were having it out with Canada over here with the Army and the SQ. And we did, we did that in support. And then we decided that declaration has been sitting on the shelf, it's been on our walls, but we need to breathe life into it. We need to make it meaningful and we need to take a stand for our, our nation now. Now is the time. So for a couple of years we sat, after we, after we left the tracks, we sat and started to put together the Entlachman Katla LT Timiko, the how we how we're gonna look after the land. Sarah referenced that we have um, indicator species. So we said our water is our most important resource. If we if we run out of good, healthy, clean water, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. And the habitat for the grizzly bear and the deer is absolutely important. If we lose the grizzly bear and the deer, we're gonna be next in line or who knows, maybe we will go before they do. Because uh, unfortunately, despite our egos, the Earth would do well if human beings weren't here tomorrow morning, right? The Earth would continue. To, the Earth would probably begin thriving again. So we told the timber companies and the mining companies. We called the provincial government together and said, not so much that we'd left town, but we said the sheriff's back in town, and there's going to be a new law in Stadlium. 
So we started to develop these codes that said if you're going to come in and you're going to work around our watersheds, you have to have larger buffer streams on our water on all streams. If you're going to come in and build roads, you have to build them at a certain time. You have to be prepared to decommission those roads. The one thing that companies really didn't like is we told them, <coughs> you'd better be prepared to accept, no, we don't want you in there. And that is a position we took. Sarah mentioned CP146. We took a position on some logging that was proposed across the lake from my community. And invariably, it was our woman who kicked the men in the ass and said, we've got to stop those guys. They can't go in. They wanted to build 27 miles of road on a steep mountain across the lake from us. And there was so much history, our people's history on the land over there. It was in trails. It was in burial places. It, I'm not sure who's, who's familiar here with cultural depressions where our winter homes were, but there were hundreds and there were culture modified red cedar trees and yellow cedar trees all over. And they had an archaeologist fly over and he waved his magic wand and said, No, there's this is too it's too steep. The terrain isn't suitable. There's there's probably nothing down there. Lo and behold, uh, after months and months of battling the timber company, they got a whole bunch of other contractors together to try and spread the spread the money and spread the, spread the perceived impact on the, on the regional economy. Uh, but we, have, we have eventually were able to convince the uh, Ministry of Forest back then, before we saw, before, after we tried a couple of injunctions, the Ministry of Forest uh, brought an independent um, forester from another region in, and he said that he'd never seen an area that held more potential for archaeological remains. And we said it's not just about, it's not just about, this cedar tree and this berry patch because we didn't have the power. Well, I guess some of our people did, the transformers and the coyote had the power to transport themselves from here to here. But we had to have a system of trails and, and we, we lived along the shoreline. Prior to contact, our, just in our valley alone, our numbers were told were in uh, probably 10,000 people around the, the two lakes that we lived by. And that's just my community. So there were probably several I don't know, it's probably fair to say that there was probably 50 to 70,000 Stadlium prior to contact and prior to um, diseases that were, were brought across the water. Um, so the companies, we know we eventually won that battle. A stop work order was put on CP146. So what happened after that was, um, unfortunately, um, Provinces, the province of British Columbia, despite a number of court cases, Chilcotin, uh, for example, Delgamook, Delgam, the second Delgamook decision came down when we were across in our camp, and uh, you know that that was a pretty profound and a pretty profound court case. Even though we're, we're not going to rely on the courts to defend our rights or our land, we're going to do that ourselves as the protectors and the stewards. But. Um, the Delgamook decision came down, we had the stop work order, so we were really happy. We were celebrating the fact that we'd won this battle. But unfortunately, um, for those of you who are, are familiar with BC, even though we have a number of significant court cases come down the pipe now, not much has changed in terms of law or policy. There's a huge amount of denial from the province of British Columbia and the, the line agencies or dirt ministries. So we persevere. Um, We've tried to take this in the case of um, the province of British Columbia and the Stadlium. <coughs> we said we can't, we can't negotiate a treaty with you, British Columbia. You're, you're not a nation. Treaties are nation-to-nation -nation agreements, right? So the Premier Clark from British Columbia couldn't go to France and say, I, I want to negotiate a treaty with you. She'd get laughed out of the country. So we said the best we can do between the Stadlium government and the provincial government is we can work on a joint decision-making process. So if there's a proposal from third-party interest, we can sit and review their plan, and we can weigh it against our own policies and our measures, our safety measures, taking into consideration our brothers and sisters, the deer and the birds and the plants and the animals, and make sure there's a minimal, limit, a minimal impact. So you may have to log at a different time. You may have to harvest a different volume of timber over a greater period of time. You may have to be a little bit more selective about the volume of trees, the size of trees um, that you take and when you take them. So you may have to build roads in winter or you may have to log in winter to have a lighter impact on the land. 
unfortunately, the province said, you guys are asking for quite a bit, and, and that document that you guys talk about, this land use plan, is pretty damn protective. And we said, well, given where we've come from historically, are you, are you really that surprised that we would put, put a document that strong on the table? And the province said, well, we want to talk about... We'd also had a big battle with them over a, a valley called Melvin Creek, where they wanted to build a ski resort. Uh, now Senator Nancy Green Rain wanted to build a ski resort smack dab in the middle of our territory in this beautiful valley. And, um, but we did some history checks with our own people and they said we, we, we can't let her build in there. So unfortunately, uh, 15 years later, Nancy still wants to build her dream ski resort and we're still saying no, but we still have a friend of, a, friend of ours up there who's still sitting up there keeping guard on the place. Historically, we had 10 or 11 communities. We now have 12 because the Statlium Chiefs Council has designated Shudikath or the place where this current camp is as our newest settlement. So, and that's a really, uh, so the province came to us and said, well, we've given Nancy the environmental certificate to go and build a ski resort. And we said, well, why isn't she doing anything then? Because they know that, that Stuff is going to hit the fan if they start making a move there. We'll have, a, we'll have another battle on the ground. And we said, we're prepared to talk about why does there have to be another ski resort in this particular place in the province of British Columbia? Whistler's now, Whistler's 45 minutes away. Um, Kamloops has several ski resorts. Uh, Vernon and Kelowna have several ski resorts. There's a lot of ski resorts in the province of British Columbia. So we took that battle internationally as well. I've been to Germany to talk about the ski resort and the impacts. And we've gone to other places in the world to say, despite what Canada and despite what British Columbia are saying, it isn't a, a really wonderful, rosy picture. Unfortunately, um, the indigenous brothers and sisters in the room know that if you're indigenous, you're born into conflict and you have to be prepared to take a hard line. Now, mind you, I'm infamous for telling third-party interests in our territory and the government, that um, governments, that we're, pre we, we're prepared to do things the easy way, we're prepared to do it the hard way. I like doing it the easy way, but unfortunately we don't get to do it the easy way all the time. It always means that you have to <coughs> be prepared. So we've developed a five-point strategy, if you can put that up there, and that, that says that if you have an issue coming up and you want to challenge that issue, we utilize this in CP146. We said we, if we're going to have direct action, we've got to be ready. We've got to know who's going to be there. We have to know the strength and the measures our people are prepared to take. But you can't just focus all of your energy on direct action because in, invariably you're going to be faced with an injunction. So have your legal strategy. Get your lawyers on speed dial. Know your positions and be able to articulate them very well. Make sure the public is aware be ready for negotiations, because it might present itself, the opportunity, so know your bottom line, know what's, what you're able to put on the table and what's not on the table. Um, what else do we have up there? Sarah's hiding it on me. <laughs> Communi communication and outreach, make sure the public knows what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. Otherwise, you can alienate the general public really quickly. We had that situation happen several times over the ski resort, over the logging we tried to stop because we're impacting the regional economy. And we said, well, if mining is going to slow down, if forestry is going to show, slow down for a while, that just means that the land has an opportunity to recover. Finally, and this four-point action strategy was something that um, George Emanuel, the late George Emanuel, the, with the Native Indian Brotherhood, and he's from British Columbia, he was the past president of the Indian and BC Indian Chiefs and one of the founders of that organization. He said, you've got to have this four-point strategy, and we, we took that to heart. But the thing that we realized as well, that we have to make sure we keep our energy level up, and we have to do, cer we have to do ceremonies, and we have to conduct prayer. Otherwise, we can go off path. The thing that's really important here is not to put all of your energy into any one, one of those areas. You have to balance it out and be ready on all fronts. Emma? Emma. All right, so I think that's it. But it's tough to put it all in a nutshell in like 12 minutes. It's, uh, <laughs> as you can tell, I could probably write a book, and maybe that'll be one of our next projects. So, thank you.
Thank you very much. It's even harder to put it into 12 minutes when you don't have peer pressure at the table beside you, <laughs> as others have, uh, have had to uh, experience. Um, we, we, let's take uh, a, a few questions before we uh, move into our uh, breakout groups. Thank you, Gary and Sarah. That was a wonderful presentation on the situation at Stratlium. What's the importance of the the declaration, the, the, the Lillooet Declaration and all this, and how you're mobilizing that today, here and now? Well, the declaration is, is fundamental. It, uh, I guess it could be compared to our Magna Carta, like our Constitution. So it, it's the bottom line. That it says that we can't extinguish the land. It says that we're prepared to, to work with the governments or the Crown. Um, and it clarifies for us and it, it, it grounds us everything that we do from here, from here on in and for the past several years says that we have to honor the declaration, we have to honor the, the vision that our chiefs back then had because it's pretty, it's pretty, um, it's pretty profound, it's pretty meaningful and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a good percentage of our people had it tattooed on the inside of their eyelids, they know it by heart now. So, and they remind us as leaders about that opportunity or about, about our responsibility and our obligations to the land and to the people. Are you done? I'll add maybe one more thing to this. Um, when the declaration came about, there was a lot of um, uh, question from the interior chief to what degree they want to work with the um, coastal um, chiefs and align with them because they felt their position is distinct, but their position would be stronger in working and joining forces on that. Um, and I think there was a, a, a long process um, forming alliances and think and get putting heads together and thinking strategically on various petitions declarations um, to create an overall body of um, um, law and vision together that that could be used but we're currently looking to find the um, original of the declaration if it's possible uh, I've looked in many places and um, I think it would be very very powerful to uh, retrieve that document and bring it back and, and um, have a big, big uh, fest uh, to, uh, to honor it. Even though he's, I think, very right that it's imprinted. What did you say, imprint, tattooed into your brain or behind your eyes, or, yeah. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I'm a question for Gary. If, uh, if you had one wish from this new federal government, what it would be? Um, whether it's for, every, for all First Nations in Canada or for the Statlium, but either, either way. Well, I think I'd have two wishes. Um, all right, yeah, you do have pretty hair, Justin. <laughs> and you are daddy's boy. Uh, got a really good pedigree. Um, the election is over. Made some big promises. Um, let's not wait too long for the inquiry on, into the murdered and missing Indigenous woman. It's a really important issue in all of our communities. It needs to be. Let's get on with it. Let's not wait anymore. Um, the situation for our communities where drinking water is concerned for many of our communities that face boil water advisories, if they even have good clean water coming out of their taps. Uh, I just visited, uh, visited um, brothers and sisters in Amjanang in the Chemical Valley and to see the situation that these people have had to live under for the past several decades, um, to hear 22 year old girls tell me that they remember being in daycare and it was a normal occurrence before recess or before nap or whatever time it is in, in daycare. But for them to grab their, you know, to have to shake their puffers and, and have a puff or two before they could have a nap or before they could go outside is, and, and to have chemical plants all around their, their resting place for their deceased is, is really horrible. And when is that situation gonna change or is it gonna change? A lot of people have said, um, 
why don't you guys move? And you don't want, nobody here wants to leave their homeland or where they're born or where their heart is and where their ancestors are buried. So let's get on with the, the, the inquiry and let's improve living conditions for Aboriginal people, especially where water is concerned. I was wondering what was uh, the content of the agreement with BC Hydro that you referred to? We achieved, uh, after 20 years of negotiation, we achieved an agreement that uh, saw $206 million that will flow to our nation over a 50-year period, uh, a trust to be established that will be, become a nest egg for uh, many ventures or initiatives that we want to undertake based on the amount of impact to your community, you get a portion of that. So my community facing the largest, uh, the biggest impact as a result of Hydro's presence or footprint impact, uh, we get 21% of the CAS settlement. The um, document we have, there's three, there were three particular types of agreements. One was a broader nation agreement. Second was an, an agreement specifically with each of the participating communities. And then finally, um, what, we, what we've coined a relations agreement. So that from now on, because of BC Hydro's legacy for the past 70 years in our territory has been that there's been no opportunity for us. Like I said, we didn't get power, even though power has been generated a mile down the road on former reserve land. Um, we didn't get power till 72. So from now on, when BC Hydro is, is thinking about doing anything different or and new projects that come up, um, or there should be, there's got to be opportunity. So BC Hydro has to do business, has to do business differently in Stadlium territory from now on. So. Training and employment. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, along with that, um, we've established Stadlium Government Service, which will, will receive funding from a portion of that agreement as well. There's training and employment, there's fisheries programs, the water use plan is, the work on our side is, is partially done and funded from that. So there's some mitigated measures that'll be in place for probably five to, in some cases, 15 years. But uh, those are some really positive aspects. And, and some people will, will uh, remark that we're getting paid to clean up the damage now um, that BC Hydro has created. And I don't know if anybody can tell, but uh, I spent 18 years as the leader of my community. And I had the good opportunity to sit on the negotiations for the, the 20 years that it, that it took to settle the agreement. So. I'm, a, I'm now a recovering politician. <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible to recover? <laughs> Some. <laughs> That's great. Uh, well, well, thank you again both for a really heartfelt and, and illuminating story. And, uh, another. All right, so before we let you go, uh, I want to honor our opportunity to get together. We have a song that we're, I'm going to sing, and it's our bear song. So, and it's, it's, it's uh, significant in that the bear is one of our main indicator species. <laughs> <laughs>